Hey everyone and welcome back. Today we'll be looking at the concept of access modifiers in Unreal C++ or C++ in general really. And this is one of those things that new developers can really struggle to understand but are actually quite simple in theory. Of course, I don't say this to cast shade on anybody who's tried to look at these before and doesn't quite understand it or hasn't grasped it. Uh, it's more just to reassure you that after some examples and perhaps implementing some of these into your own projects, you should quickly be able to pick up the concept and that you shouldn't be looking at it as something that's quite as daunting. So I'm gonna go into the pawn class that I've set up previously as there are some examples of the access modifiers in here. So first of all, what are the access modifiers? And we can see here that we have three different types of modifiers and they've all been used in the pawn class. And that is the public, protected and private modifier. So these have all been declared here and anything that falls below the declaration is then classed as either a public, private or protected function or variable. And if you've worked with any of the default classes in the Unreal C++ setup before, you've likely seen some of or all of these used in those classes. So the first and most simple of these to understand is gonna be the public accessor and anything placed below the public declaration is immediately made visible and editable inside of this class and any other classes, meaning that the function can be called and variables can be altered from outside of the class in which they're declared. Now this can be really useful for cross-class communications, but it should be used very sparingly as it opens the issue of losing track of where your variables are being altered and is classed as an unsafe development approach. So in the example here, you can see that I've created a variable and a function in the pawn base class inside of the public section. I've then gone over to the character class and included a reference to the pawn class. And this will allow me to alter the value of the declared variable and then also call the function that's inside of the pawn class. Okay, so back over in the pawn class, I'm back in the pawn base.h. The next access modifier that we're going to look at is the private access modifier, and that's because this is basically the exact opposite of the public modifier. So anything declared in the private section will be accessible only to the class in which it's been declared. Therefore, this is obviously going to be classed as the safest development process that ensures that variables cannot accidentally be changed from outside of the class in which they were defined. And of course, functions cannot be called from other classes either. So again, in the background, I've just gone ahead and added a small example, variable and function, but this time I've declared them as private. And then back in the character class with the same references and everything that we set up previously, we can see that this time, even though we have the reference um, and the include files and everything to the same pawn class, we're unable to find those new private functions and variables that we've just declared. So we can see here that with both of those, even though we've got the for IntelliSense and everything going as well, we are getting the errors uh, just saying that they are unable to access or have any knowledge of the functions and variables within the private section. Another thing to note as well is that anything that you declare outside of any of these modifiers, so for example, the section just up here at the top of the script, so before we have any of the public, private, or protected declared, if we put a variable here, then that float would also be by default classed as a private variable. So again, that would be secure within the classes declared. So of course, it's always gonna be recommended that variables and functions are private unless you have a very good argument to make them public. For example, if you need to update variables from one class to another, you would usually use what's called a getter and setter encapsulation where the get and set functions are public and update the private variables within those getter and setter functions. But encapsulation would be a kind of separate topic by itself. So just know that it exists and look into that if you're interested and it's something I'll cover in the future. So that leaves us with the protected modifiers. This one is very similar to the private modifier in that other classes will not have access to anything declared in the protected section. However, this does extend access to derived classes. So any classes which inherit from the class that you've created, the variables or functions in the protected section will also have access to those variables and functions. So a really common example of this, and one that we can see just here, is if you're familiar with the begin play function. This is a function declared in the actor class. 
And as you're probably already familiar with, even if you weren't sure why, any class that derives from the actor class, such as pawns, like the one that we're currently in, can also call the begin play function. So this is done by declaring it as a virtual function in the derived class, and also adding the override just here if you intend to not only call the begin play function and the logic which is included in the base class, but also if you're looking to override it with your own functionality. So this means then that if we call this in the pawn class, as we're already over overriding the begin play functionality, we'd also call the super begin play, which will first run all of the logic inside of the actor begin play. And we can take a look at that just here. So by doing a quick control and F and finding this, we can see where the virtual void has been declared for the begin play in the protected section of the actor header. If we hop over to the code class, We've just done a quick search back into the begin play of the code class as well. And we can see here that what that would mean is the super call would call everything to run everything inside of this begin play. So setting up the components, the lifespan and things like that. So all of the stuff which is done behind the scenes by default by the engine that we want to happen on all of our actor classes. But of course, we don't want to have to manually set that up each time. So that's what this is doing. So that will be called here in the super call on the begin play in our pawn class. And then the override is allowing us to also add the logic that we've put down here. So the checking of integers pointlessly and the demo function that does nothing. So this is currently going a little bit more into inheritance as well. So this kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of inheritance uh, and a little bit of encapsulation as well. Um, but all of these, as I've said, will be other topics completely by themselves. But it's useful to just understand the very basics of those concepts to just understand how these things are running, what's being called, and the kind of execution order of those. It's also worth mentioning as well that I focused a lot on the functions in the protected section, but this will apply to variables, not just functions. So for example, if we have an enemy class that we create, which may have a number of derived classes, so the enemy would be the base class, you'd want to share a number of functions and variables to the child enemy classes. And you could declare something like an integer called legs, which would be the number of legs the enemies have. So that would be declared in the base class. All of the child classes would also have a knowledge of what legs are, and it would allow you to expose those and set them for the specific enemy types. So you could then take your protected legs variable and set your orc to have two legs, your direwolf to have four legs, and the naga to have zero legs. So that's how you would use these protected variables by filtering them down in the child classes and being able to set them to the specific class that they're used in. So just to summarize and really just make sure it makes sense why we would use different types and which should be used where. Generally, where possible, you should be trying to use the private modifiers for code maintainability and class security. Again, unless you absolutely know that you'll be deriving this class and certain variables and functions might be used in the child class, in which case you would use your protected modifier. And of course, the public modifiers should be used sparingly. And when you know that you absolutely have to have a function or a variable updated from another class. And the public modifiers is one of those things where, especially with newer developers, you kind of get the overuse of that. And you can very easily then lose track, like I've mentioned briefly, with variables being updated and called from outside of the class they're declared in. It's going to make it harder to track down where that's happening. And you may have done a test at one point with a public variable, forgot to set it back, still had a call from another class to change the player speed at some point during gameplay. And then you have to do a lot of debugging to find out why player speed is suddenly being multiplied by five or something. And that's because you made a public call from another class and you forgot to change it back. So without repeating myself and the points that I've made, I've kind of covered each concept in as complex a way as it really goes. So if you still needed a little bit more of an understanding of this, then it's going to be worth looking through the default Unreal classes and the example projects just to see which modifiers are implemented, uh, where and how they're implemented and the kind of effects it's having. As always, a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. It's your support of the channel that allows me to keep making videos like this. And if you wanted to show your support for the channel, then do check out the description below. Links for that will be provided down there. Of course, if you did enjoy or find the video useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps. And of course, do consider subscribing to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. As ever, though, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.